Hello, hello everyone. Um, I'm Andrea Bolzoni. I'm a, a PhD student here at the Open University. My um, talk today will be a um, broad overview of my research project, and um, in the second part of the presentation, I will talk more into details about a specific contribution I'm working on. Uh, Broadly, the uh, question I'm uh, trying to uh, answer, I'm tackling, is how can we improve interactive music systems for sound-based music? Now, uh, what kind of um, systems I'm interested in? Um, computational systems for music improvisation, which can be uh, described as uh, digital software systems that act, in some sense, as an improvising partner with creative agency. More into details, I'm interested in uh, interactive reflexive musical systems, uh, which can be defined as the class of interactive systems in which users can interact with virtual copies of themselves. Um, because I'm interested in having a musician exploring their own creativity uh, with basically variations of the sounds and the music they play. Now, um, the type of music of, or genre or sounds I'm interested in are the sound based and uh, uh, how can we um, define them compared to note based music? So, well, sound based music, in sound based music we can find electroacoustic and noise uh, music or music played with uh, instruments like mouth harp and didgeridoo, while in note based music uh, we can find, you know, uh, sonata, sonatas for piano, instrumental pop songs. Of course, it is a very broad um, distinction, but it's just to have some uh, references and um, again, for, to, to have some um, old examples, we can listen to some um, Joe Arp for the sound based music, which should start. <laughs> here that the main differences, let's say, are that in the sound base we have mainly a sound continua and uh, changes in timbre and intensity, while in the um, note based music, let's say, we have mainly sequences of discrete uh, events, which are notes, so pitch based melodies and harmonies. Um, so um, then, to uh, generate copies of uh, or variations of uh, music and sound played by a musician, we need to model um, sequences of, of those sounds. So um, how does it work for sound-based music? Uh, how uh, has it been implemented in uh, the literature so far? Where, well, we, have, uh, we start with an audio corpus. We want to find the main elements, so we segment this audio corpus. Then um, there is a feature extraction uh, and uh, generally, we, uh, there is a um, uh, compression of this information, so we compute summary uh, statistic of it in these features. Um, then once we have this information, we can cluster these segments uh, in um, classes, and uh, then now we can model the sequences of these segments, and therefore also generate uh, sequences that are, to an extent, similar to the corpus VEF model. And the technique we can use, for example, is a con concatenative sound synthesis. Now, there are a um, number of limitations with this uh, uh, approach. Uh, I will just mention um, a couple of, um, yeah, let's say, consideration uh, we can do about this. So the first one is that if we compute summary statistics on uh, the content of each segment, uh, we lose information about shape. So uh, we, as we saw uh, just a minute ago, in sound-based music, uh, it's very important how um, features develop in, in, in inside segments, so that the shape of these features. Um, and uh, second, uh, the generated audio is limited to the sounds included into the audio database. So we have an audio database we segmented, and then to generate sequ sequences, we just we can only use those sounds. Um, so now. The question is, how can we use these, uh, the information about shape to, um, let's say, uh, expand um, the uh, audio database we can use to generate sounds? Um, so, yeah, so, exactly how, um, so the first point is, how can we, uh, what are shapes? I've mentioned shape a few times. Um, 
they can be in literature, they are defined as images uh, of dynamic unfolding, for example, or we can associate them with profiles, contours, or gestures. And uh, as an, an example, we can listen to these, um, just very simple example. Right, which is a filtered uh, white noise with a bandpass filter. If we uh, extract the spectral centroid from this sample, we will see uh, this shape, which can be the gesture that the musician used to uh, play this, this sample, right? Uh, so then how can we use these descriptor shapes to, as I said, generate new segments with similarities to the uh, original audio database? So how can we expand on these? Um, in the uh, second part in what remains in my of my presentation, I will just, uh, I will provide an example of what I mean without going into details about, uh, about the model I've, I've implemented. I've recorded myself a couple of minutes of sounds uh, produced with this instrument, which is, uh, which is a down noise in the family of the mouth harp. Um, and uh, this, these sounds sound more or less like this. <laughs> What I wanted to do was to have a model that uh, was able to, um, gener to um, take um, samples, segments um, produced with this instrument and uh, uh, vary them, generate variations operating on uh, one of these um, audio descriptors, spectral centroid spread and amplitude. So um, I'm gonna show just one example. Um, so what if we uh, have these uh, um, segment is, um, yeah, the sample. We'll play it again. Okay. And we want to um, vary the spectral spread of these samples. So what if we take only these audio descriptor, this feature, and uh, we want to change it with a line going from 2000 Hertz to 1000 Hertz? Well, what we get, what we can get is uh, a sound like this. So we go from these, I'm sorry, there is this filter in PowerPoint that unfortunately cuts a little bit of the sound. And we go to this sound. So what we produce is a variation that is similar to an extent to the original one, but varies only on one um, axis. So uh, as we can see here in the plot, in blue we have the original spectral spread, the, the spectral spread of the uh, input segment. In green, uh, we have the uh, conditioning, so the, the output I wanted from the um, reconstruction as a spectral spread, and in yellow is a spectral spread that I extracted from the output. So we can see that we can actually change these axes. And uh, most more, uh, mm, is, is, uh, important as well is that we can see that we don't change the other two um, audio descriptors don't change. So here we have in blue the original spectral centroid and in yellow the spectral centroid extracted from the um, reconstructed segment. And uh, here we have the amplitude. So we can see that we can change just one of these features without touching the others. So uh, the conclusions, uh, we, um, I mentioned how the shape of all the, descriptor of all the features is a fundamental component in sound-based music. Um, we saw how modeling and generation of sound-based sequences can be limited in terms of available sounds and shape representation. And um, I'm proposing and working on a method to expand the available sound um, using audio descriptor shapes. Uh, these are the references and thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, I think your, your title has the word timbral, uh, yeah. and the only uh, specific parameters referred to as spectral centroid uh, yeah. and spectral spread. Yeah. Uh, do you think those are very adequate as descriptions of timbre, or are you adding to, uh, planning to add further descriptors? Uh, no, I, I'm definitely, uh, I'm using further descriptors. In this case, I just use these uh, um, subset for illustration purposes. Uh, and um, to be fair, for these instruments, they are, quite, um, um, uh, I would say, uh, convenient or coherent with the uh, uh, sounds produced by the with the mouth art, but definitely uh, I will, um, I'm planning to use more, yeah. What like, would be your next highest priority after centroid and spread? Uh, so, um, 
I will refer to some, um, th there are a couple of papers, or three, um, where uh, it's been shown that for a subset of the descriptors, we can uh, perceive trajectories, like um, for um, uh, the, the, the slope or, uh, in our, or uh, the deviation uh, or of uh, the spectra. Um, so yeah, these will be the, the next ones, or the ones I, I'm already experimenting. I had a very similar question to Alan, actually, yeah. but just to follow up on that point. Um, so what you're, what you're doing is you're choosing a few features sort of a priori and saying that these are the things that represent the salient properties in this kind of music. So let's analyze them, manipulate them, and resynthesize new sorts of things. Yeah. Sort of by doing that, you end up creating a musical vocabulary that does now prioritize those particular yeah. things. And so it, when this kind of system encounters a form of music making that is pre-existent from, you know, from a different culture, for example, how do you think you might work with musicians to kind of work out what the salient features are, especially yeah. if they don't necessarily have kind of familiar descriptions in NMIR sense? Yeah, uh, thanks for the question. Uh, so, um, yeah, um, there is definitely, uh, it's not easy to, um, let's say, sonorize specific audio descriptors, specific features. Uh, it's something I've, I've been experimenting with, but I, I, I had issues. Um, one, um, the plan is definitely to work with musicians, to, so ask musicians to record um, uh, some sounds and then uh, use those sounds to uh, let's say um, the idea is to segment the audio corpus um, taking um, on different audio descriptors. So, for example, measuring the, a novelty feature on different audio descriptor, different audio descriptors, segment, uh, producing different segmentations, and have the musician musicians listen to the segmentation, and uh, if uh, and the segmentation that works better for them would be for me to an extent the um, descriptor that uh, works better to describe that, that audio corpus, if it makes sense. Yeah. It's, it's just one technique um, to, 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 to sort it down, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Super easy. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. So, if there's time, uh, just one more question here, yeah. um, and maybe it's a, a s two related parts. Um, one is I'm wondering if you could maybe clarify just a little bit more what you mean by sound-based music. Um, it yeah. seems like Beethoven uh, is getting yeah. thrown into the note-based camp, and that would assume that, like orchestration, for instance, the timbral nuances of orchestration yeah. don't matter in Beethoven's music popular music also thrown into that camp, which arguably is a kind of oral-based music, right? Often, like, yeah. the album itself is the text. Um, so is sound-based music for you a certain tradition of composition? Is it the lay landy style of sound-based music, a charismatic tradition, and so on? And related to this, I'm curious about um, the assumption that note-based music is written music, uh, and that sound-based music is somehow not. It's, uh, it's part of this sort of uh, second orality of recorded music, perhaps. But um, in fact, in all the things you're doing, you're actually graphing yep. these shapes. Yep. And so yep. it is being written at a kind of machine readable level here. So does the fact that these sound based shapes are being written mean that they're no longer sound based, I guess? Yeah, that, yeah that, that's a good point. Thanks for. Uh, for the question, so the, the first part of the question, uh, yes, there are a lot of, there is a lot of overla overlapping, of course. Uh, it's not um, a clear cut, it's not a clear difference between note based and sound based. Um, I, uh, I myself come from uh, an, an electroacoustic composition background and I'm a an guitarist and improviser as, himself, uh, as well, so I, uh, I put in that, let's say, um, group, uh, all the, that kind of music that um, it doesn't have, 
the, so it's not related to that and being written or not, is um, producing sounds that, let's say, cannot be um, represented by uh, notes, by pitches. Um, so that, that would, I would say that's the main difference. So if we can codify um, uh, the, mm, uh, some music with notes, e either, e either if it's written or not, I will say that's note-based. And if we cannot, I will put it under the, the sound-based. Being aware that it's not so, um, you know, um, it's, not, uh, it's not so defined as, as a mm, different, it's not so uh, clear cut, yeah. Uh, so it's, it's definitely something I, I, I have to keep in mind, as well as um, like continuous changes in pitch, uh, you know, how do we treat them? So uh, I would say we can treat them from a sound-based perspective to an extent because we are looking more at continuous, at continuous changes in sound rather than, than having uh, discrete changes. Maybe this is another way, yeah. Okay, we're going to move to the next speaker, so thank you, Andrea. Thank you. Thank you very much.